Hello everyone, welcome to Liam's Lyceum. I am your host, uh, Liam, aka Hembar, and today I have another fantasy essay I want to discuss with you. This is the 11th one um, I will be talking about, uh, so I definitely have some other ones by Tolkien, uh, Le Guin, Moorcock, Liber, um, other people. Uh, so I'll mention a few of the other ones uh, as they come up um, in today's uh, video, but uh, I thought I'd be dressed a little fancy, like a, like I'm a Liam Grammaticus or something like that today. Um, actually, because this essay has been discussed before uh, by Dr. Fantasy, which Philip Chase and uh, Wrath Blue Taxed. Now, this essay is Epic Fantasy in the Modern World by Stephen R. Donaldson, um, who is most famously known as the author of Lord Fowl's Bane. I have not read this, so I, I should preface that. I have not read this, and this is kind of an essay of basically just explaining... I think uh, Donaldson's writing a fantasy, essentially. Um, but it, it's kind of targeted as broader in general, specifically epic fantasy, of course, um, hence the title of the essay. There is a follow-up essay called um, Epic Fantasy Necessary Reading, I believe, um, which when necessary literature, that's what it was. Uh, and when Philip in Wrath uh, spoke um, about this essay, they also spoke about that one. I was gonna, I'm gonna do separate videos because that's what I do. I like to see the the difference in it in separate videos. For example, when I did um, Moorcock's uh, Epic Pooh, that came out later than his um, Aspects of Fantasy essay, I believe that's what it's called. Um, and so I I've, I've talked about both of those essays. They have a little different focus as well. So so in this case. Um, this what this essay was available for free online. That's where I found it on uh, Donaldson's website. Uh, I've heard the link hasn't worked before. I will link it below, um, assuming that it will work. But it is originally from 1986, and it is about 15 pages. It's not terribly long. It's not the shortest I've read either for this series. Um, but essentially, Donaldson starts with the question of why, and specifically why has he had so much success with selling his books, right? So he's looking for an answer to that question. So he says this, my ambitions as a writer have always been intensely serious in the aesthetic and literary senses. And so the idea that my books would become popular just never crossed my mind. The fact is that the kind of goals and purposes I have as a writer are the kind which usually produce books that sell six or eight copies to the author's relatives and then vanish. Uh, which, yeah, sounds about right, I guess. Um, but then he goes on to say the answer as to the why is, is because of what he writes, um, which is epic fantasy. Uh, so he then goes into both these words to explain why epic fantasy is popular. Um, and so he starts with fantasy. It's fantasy first here. So uh, he explains um, his time on a radio show that sounds uh, very eccentric. Um, you should just read it, I guess. Uh, I'm not going to explain it exactly here, but Donaldson makes a joke of this uh, experience when the interviewer asked him, so tell me, Mr. Donaldson, what is fantasy? He says, well, I thought this was one of these those questions where the answer is implicit in the question. Buddy, this is fantasy, or more properly speaking, horror, because uh, it's a very weird experience he was having. I think it was in Portland, and this was in uh, the 80s, early 80s. But but he says his real answer is this. So this is another quote. It says, put simply, fantasy is a form of fiction in which the internal crises or conflicts or processes of the characters are dramatized as if they were external individuals or events. Crudely stated, this means that in fantasy, the characters meet themselves, or parts of themselves, their own needs, problems, and um, exigencies. As actors on the stage of the story, and so the internal struggle to deal with those needs slash problems, exigencies, is played out as an external struggle in the action of the story. Uh, he says simplified, well, I think is kind of like a simple answer that is as long as that, so I don't, I, I'm simplifying it even for you. It says it has the, that... The world in fantasy is an expression of the characters, uh, specifically Lord Fowl in Thomas Covenant is Covenant's reality of being leprous, essentially. It's, it's his negative parts of himself. Um, it may be even specifically his reaction to being leprous. He's not a very good guy. Uh, I know a decent amount about the book. I have not read it, though. Um, so he says seeing Lord Fowl as a phony villain is what has caused fantasy to be considered uh, or called simply escapist. Um, but he says these critics have missed the point, and I would agree with him there. So, so far, so good. Uh, yeah, so far, so good. Uh, so he says that outside, um, the outside 
is an externalization or a metaphor of the internal. He says, magic is therefore an expression of the character's charisma and force of personality. Um, it is a way to discuss how human beings are greater than the sum of their parts. Um, which, you know, that sounds good too. Uh, confronting this stuff is confronting a uh, confronting part of yourself. Uh, though seeing uh, magic as one owns virtue and the unconscious mind, it, it's not a terrible definition uh, of magic. He kind of glosses over this idea of magic in the sense he doesn't try to define it really. Um, but uh, he doesn't tie it into like religion or, you know, anything else like that. I guess it's not so authentic, but if you want more ideas on magic, then you can go look at Magic Systems Aren't Magic, uh, which I did a video essay on with by and with DJ Butler because he was gracious enough to come on and talk to me about um, his little essay. But anyways, he goes on to say that personification is important in this fantasy. Um, it is actually the most important, and it's a part of allegory. I'm not so sure I agree with him. Um, I, can, I can get it. So right? this is it's kind of depends on the definition of what you what you're calling allegory, I guess. Um, so since a classic example of allegory allegory would be like Pierce Plowman, something over Narnia, which you know you could argue is not allegory, uh, right? Especially when compared to something like Pierce Plowman, and definitely over Lord of the Rings, which you know almost no one would call allegory, but it is symbolic, right? So what, what's the difference? Is allegory just symbolism? Because if that's the case, then Lord of the Rings is allegory but i don't think that's the case um you know like allegory seems to be one for one at least in my opinion which is why i would say narnia is not even allegory right because the white witch is not satan right so um there's a lot of stuff that's they're not allegories uh, you know I mean, there is no allegory for it there is stuff that's symbolic but it's not allegorical um so anyways but the lord of the rings is better though specifically because it's not allegory it's better than allegory right it is this you know, metaphor of the, it's human experience, right? Symbolized in a sense, right? Externalized, right? That's what, that is what he's talking about, right? So it then goes on to say that, um, that basically this is not done in contemporary fiction. He's generalizing heavily. He'll generalize a lot in this essay, actually, which is where the problems come in. He says it's, it's more cynical. It's postmodernist. He doesn't use the word there, but he's, you know, he's being very specific after World War II literature, contemporary literature, not fantastic stuff. Um, he says it's a view of humanity being swallowed by the void, essentially. Um, he says instead of, and but he insists that instead of Sartre's idea of man is a futile passion, the writers um, of fantasy, epic fantasy in particular, because epic fantasy is cool, I guess, but the other kinds are not, uh, which we'll get to again, um, they make the idea as man is an effective passion. I mean, it's not something that, you know, is just going to get swallowed by the void is something that can challenge the void um, and make good out of that situation, essentially. So um, I think he's right in a sense that that's probably why epic fantasy is popular. Uh, I think he's generalizing a little too much, though. But anyway, so then I'll talk a little bit about that later, though. He says he finally gets to what epic means. So that's fantasy, right? And he says all epics, meaning Paradise Lost, Beowulf, uh, Fairy Queen, I think is another one he mentions, and Idols of the King. Uh, their, their fantasy is what essentially you're saying. And this may fit his definition of fantasy. It's a little too easy, but again, just for the sake of, you know, having a 15-page essay, that's that's not too difficult to agree with, I guess. He does say that Epic uh, tackles important questions. Um, I think this is, again, kind of going into dangerous territory, yeah, since um, this kind of implies that non-Epic fantasy doesn't answer important questions. He even says that Robert E. Howard is bad and that you cannot convince him that Robert E. Howard is a good author and Donaldson is wrong. So um, just to put it bluntly, he's obviously very easily misread a lot of fantasy here. Um, and it kind of comes off as rather conceited. Um, so I mean, like, but it, he still has some points though. So anyways, uh, it's it's kind of saying what he writes is what is considered great literature. And I get it, you know, you're, you're kind of advertising for yourself here. But he's also, in a sense, right, he's supposed to be explaining why he sold so much. I don't know. Um, so I think he does Beowulf decent justice when he talks about it. Um, he doesn't really get into why it's, con or, yeah, he doesn't really get into why it's considered an epic, um, which, again, is another argument there. Some would say epics are only, like, really national epics. Uh, he does a decent job. But it says the character in Beowulf, for example, is magic. So the character and magic are one, right? They're not separated. Uh, 
I think I don't know. It, it's interesting. Anyway, but he also compares this to Idols of the King specifically, where um well he says Idols of the King is is basically the end of fantasy, essentially, uh, which is ridiculous. But uh um he also because he basically he seems to forget that Beowulf Beowulf is not just success, Beowulf dies at the end of Beowulf. Spoiler alert. And he fails, you know, like, I mean, like, it is a lament. Beowulf was a lament. That's the common word you'll hear with Anglo-Saxon poetry. Beowulf was a lament, okay? It is not a success. It is a epic in a way because it's connected to these people's nation, national identity in a sense, potentially, right? These people might identify with the Geats, for example. I don't know. We don't know. You know what I mean? But Tom Chippy would say something like that, probably. So he's, he's kind of missing the point a little bit here, uh, right? But he says, Tolkien such as taking from Beowulf, which he points out, um, he took back the epic. So fantasy didn't exist between Idols of the King and Tolkien, which is totally bogus. Like, I already mentioned Robert E. Howard, Fritz Leiber wrote before Tolkien did. Um, well, I guess The Hobbit came out, but he's specifically talking about The Lord of the Rings. Um, so Leiber, uh, Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, William Morris, uh, <laughs> Haggard, I don't know, a lot of other guys, uh, Dunsany, so he's he's kind of he's putting a lot on Lord of the Rings here, which is really interesting. Um, and Lord of the Rings is similarly a lament, though he doesn't mention that, right? It's like there is no, it's not like awesome and epic in a sense. You know what I mean, like it's not like woo, everything's good now, you know? Because Lord of the Rings ends heartbreakingly, I, I think. You know what I mean? So he, he's really missing a lot. I feel like, um, and it's interesting because like. They're, they're, these are heroes in Tolkien, right? And there are heroes in fantasy between Tennyson and Tolkien, though Donaldson doesn't seem to think so. Um, so doesn't Tolkien doesn't give an allegory, so he's cool. Allegory is only a dirty word because Tolkien didn't really like it. Um, but he also doesn't... Apparently, Tolkien fails in a sense because he doesn't connect it back to us. Um, Donaldson does, which is how he succeeds, I guess, um, by making his work... Well, essentially, portal fantasy to re reintegrate us with the epic, to re-enchant the human, right? He he has this human <laughs> that goes into fantasy land, right? Exactly. So um, I think that's a little silly. So it's awfully silly, actually, that the man can't connect to Frodo uh, just because Frodo is not from our world explicitly. Um, he, he just says it takes this one human um, and surrounds him with epic characters, right? That's Thomas Covenant, right? Um, rather than the singular epic like Arthur, who's surrounded by a bunch of humans, you know, that are not epic, they're not magical, they're just, you know, Victorian chaps, essentially, um, when you read something like Idols of the King. Um, Covenant is drawn away from his postmodernism, essentially, right? This bad stuff that's, you know, um, that is symbolized by his lep leprosy. Again, I haven't read this, I just, I know, so sorry, I'm hopefully I'm not spoiling this enough, but I guess there's some spoilers here for uh, Laura's Fowler. This book, I literally have listened to lectures on this book for years, and it's just, it's kind of old at this point, but sorry if you care. Uh, so it's interesting that it's it's cool to see what he's responding to, like, you get an idea of what he's responding to, and it makes me more excited to read Laura's Fowler's Bane, because I would like to. I have the whole trilogy, I have part of the next one, so I mean, um, but I, I haven't read it yet, so, you know, but again, Donaldson just kind of gets some wrong, not to mention, like, I kind of uh, touched on earlier that he writes off all postmodernism. Um, as much as I don't like a lot of it, uh, just generally speaking, um, alienation is a thing. Okay? And I mean, just like Tolkien felt alienated at the end of World War One, you know, um, he can't go back to his childhood, just like the people in Beowulf couldn't go back to this epic uh, time, right? It's a lament for the past. You cannot achieve it again, you know? Um, and so that is that's possible you know we're not innocent anymore 20th century is very much not right so um and it's it's just interesting because i don't know that i mean this alienation part sounds like tolkien so he missed a big chunk of tolkien i feel like um so which is you know has him writing off stuff that you shouldn't write off wholesale i mean even with how much you know you could disagree with it or not uh so this also excludes things like grimdark which wasn't a thing really then uh, and Sword and Sorcery, he, like, totally just writes. I mean, you're writing out Robbie Howard. You're writing off all Sword and Sorcery. You're basically saying it doesn't have the the themes that I like, the symbolism that I like, and so, therefore, it's not worthwhile. It's essentially all – is almost blatantly what he's saying, actually. Um, 
I think that's that makes him kind of guilty. <laughs> but uh, Grimdark itself is kind of poor as a label. So I mean, like, I guess we could forgive it for Grimdark. Um, but like, just writing off like tons of tons of fantasy. You know what I mean? That has value, even if it's not necessarily epic. It does have these heroes though. So, anyways. I'll I'll keep on rambling if I if I go on, but there is a follow up essay again from 2015. Uh, it's again epic fantasy uh, and necessary literature. I'll check that out later. Um, I imagine based off of Raf Blue Tax's video and Philip Chase's, which I'll link all these below, um, that it might remedy some of my complaints. Um, both of those videos I, I recommend. They're and again they focus on both essays in one video. I'll also link down uh, Raf's uh, video on Grimdark since some of you might find that interesting and. Uh, what is sword and sorcery my video for those curious and why sword and sorcery which kind of in some ways is a response to donaldson not like particularly i'm not attacking him it's just a reason of why you know while well, uh donaldson is essentially saying why epic fantasy here um so and then i'll link the magic systems are magic thing with butler but anyways those are my my brief thoughts on epic fantasy in the modern world by stephen r donaldson i really need to get to lord fowl's main i'd really like to uh someone needs to come and force me to read this um it's just so so long because I'm used to reading shorter books <laughs> when I can, at least. So anyways, this has been Liam from Liam's Lyceum, um, or sorry, Liam uh, Grammaticus from Liam's Lyceum. Uh, I uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, little fantasy essay video. Uh, I'll do the next Donaldson one probably next, but it has been a couple months since my last one, so who knows when that will be. But I will catch you next time.